Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. Uh, this is a little bit of a weird show for me because um, the person that I'm interviewing is not only the youngest person that I've ever had on the show, um, he also happens to be my nephew. Um, now, why would Aunt Carolyn interview her nephew for uh, the Middle East News Hour? Because my, my nephew, Matthew Foley, is running for Congress. He's running for Congress in the 6th Congressional District of the state of Maryland. Um, and, uh, and he should really win his primary on uh, July 19th. It looks like that may very well happen. And if he does, it's going to be an earthquake in Congress because um, I happen to have known him all his life. Um, but Matthew is, uh, has managed to rack up some very, very significant accomplishments in his, in his short life uh, to date um, that really speak to his ability to change the face of American politics, certainly on Capitol Hill. And I wanted to introduce you to, uh, to Matthew and to talk to him a little bit about the things that most uh, interest us um, as, uh, as Jews in Israel and the United States. And one of the most pressing issues that we have to deal with today is uh, anti-Semitism, particularly progressive anti-Semitism in the United States. And that's something that Matthew has a lot to talk about. And we also wanna talk about other things um, that are happening in the United States in terms of political polar polarization um, and uh, and uh, the, econo the economic situation afflicting Americans in general and Marylanders in particular. Um, so we're just going to spend the next hour talking about uh, talking about these issues with somebody who has a lot to say, somebody who's already done a lot, and somebody who I expect will do a lot more incredible things. So without further ado. Matthew, welcome to the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. Wow, long time listener, first time caller. Thanks so much for having me on. You're not a caller, you're a guest. You're my featured guest. So okay. let's just be very clear. You know, your 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 aunt is very precise in her language. But um, but yeah, so Matthew, first of all, can you explain why you're running for Congress and um why uh, why it's not at all crazy for you to be doing this? Um just give your Give your stump speech for a second just to introduce yourself to to um, my viewers and listeners. Well, hello to all of your viewers. And this is something that people have not yet come to terms with, which is that this is a new Republican district located right outside of D.C., going all the way to the end of Western Maryland. This this race came on the map because of redistricting. This was the first state here in Maryland where Republicans won a court battle in this uh, cycle of redistricting, a Democratic judge overturned Maryland Democrats' map as being one of the most overt racial and partisan gerrymanders they'd ever seen. So they then came together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, put together a new congressional map, which now has this as an R plus one district, which the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, who just endorsed my campaign, won by 31% in 2018, which was an otherwise terrible year for Republicans. So this race is incredibly winnable. And I filed because I said, look, we need someone who can actually win this. Before I was working as a conservative reporter, I worked at the House Republican Super PAC. So I know what it takes to defeat Democrats. And I said, all right, put me in coach. I want to run. I want to win. I want to actually represent Western Marylanders because my opponent in this race, David Trone, is, in my opinion, the laziest member of Congress. He lives in Potomac, 20 miles outside of DC, yet he skipped 25% of the votes last year. Cannot be bothered to work. One of the stories that I reported on as a journalist was how Democrats on Capitol Hill have had their offices closed and locked, claiming that this is because of the coronavirus for the past two and a half years. And they Trump, haven't opened them again uh, since uh, Corona sort of stopped becoming a, uh, stopped being like a big thing. Well, after my first story, uh, where I singled out Chuck Schumer as one of the Democrats whose offices are closed, his office opened the next day. And the week after my story, Nancy Pelosi announced that the Capitol would eventually resume allowing tourists to visit. So I did a lot more to reopen the government than most Democrats. And then I did a follow up story. I drove around Maryland, looking at all of the Maryland Democrats offices, and they're all also closed in districts. And these are taxpayer funded offices that are meant to serve constituents. So I drove all around the sixth district of Maryland and every single one of David Trone's taxpayer funded offices have been closed and locked for the past two and a half years. 
due to the coronavirus. So you go to these offices and you see them locked during business hours. You see mail piling up. No one's reading these things. Meanwhile, David Trone runs a multi-billion dollar company that's open seven days a week. So it's safe for him to do business in his company, but not safe for him to actually do the work that we elected him to. So I said, look, this is ridiculous. You have a part-time congressman and full-time problems, and we need someone who's actually going to take them seriously. So as a, in the work that I was doing as a reporter, which we'll talk a lot about in this hour, I was pointing out a lot of problems. A lot of my reporting led to congressional investigations into the Biden administration's Commerce Department, Energy Department, Homeland Security Department. And I said, look, put me in, coach. You know, I want to be part of the solution after pointing out the litany of problems that we all know we're facing. Because basically trying to have congressional hearings on things when you're in the minority is kind of a, it's a non-starter, right? I mean, the, the, the Republicans can't hold their feet to the fire because they're, they're the minority in all the congressional committees that are supposed to be exercising oversight, right? Well, you can even within congressional minority at least do some amount of meaningful oversight. And this was one of the stories that I reported was the massive conflicts of interest uh, in the Biden administration's energy department uh, led to the energy secretary selling off hundreds of thousands of shares in a private company that she was overseeing. And so you can, you can get results from the congressional minority. Of course, this is now a Republican seat that we have no business losing. So when we win seats like this and win the House majority, you're right, we'll obviously have a lot more that we can do in terms of oversight. Um, and Daryl Issa, who in my mind is one of the best examples of a congressional Republican doing oversight of a Democratic administration, was one of the first people to endorse me, which was awesome because I remember watching him, uh, you know, even though Democrats had the White House, exposing the Democrats far left anti-American energy, uh, anti-energy um, policies going back, you know, at least 10 years. So when he yeah. reached out to endorse me, I said, that's awesome. You're, uh, you're sort of an inspiration. Well, that is really, that is really awesome. And talking about energy, because uh, one of the things that Granholm has been involved with is making sure that the United States doesn't produce any so that you can look at, I mean, there was a, a report here in Israel saying that uh, gasoline, may go up uh, to over $300 a barrel soon, um, which is just, I mean, earth shattering. You know, that, that, that makes it impossible to do business at all because you've just placed everything out of, out of, out of reach. Um, so, you know, what, what could you do in Congress um, as a, to try to shift American energy policy towards something that's rational and sane like domestic production and and I'll just and I'll just ask that question a little bit more widely because you know one of the things that you find is that you know America needs a lot of uh, capital long-term investments in energy if you want it to be more effective you have to build new refineries and and power plants and all the rest of it and who's going to invest money if every four years they have another Democrat who is running the green agenda of the I don't know Communist Party, and you you can't get anything you can't get any you 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 never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, that's the problem, right? And elections have consequences here, and so we saw this with Biden the day he took office. He declared war on American energy, canceling the Keystone Pipeline, and that gets to exactly the point: is oil companies want certainty in the markets. And if they think that every four to eight years, we're going to have a Democrat in the White House who's going to, on day one, declare war on these companies, it's going to make it that much harder for us to be energy independent as we were just two years ago in the Trump administration. So it is a huge problem. But what we can do is at least force the issue more while we wait to take the White House back in the next two years, because the, the Democrats' policies on everything, and we'll talk a lot more about this, are completely backwards. They're still living in this permanent pandemic mode, yet they're trying to punish Americans, small businesses, energy uh, jobs, without recognizing that these jobs and these industries were just devastated during the coronavirus. And the Department of Energy is one of the worst culprits of this, right? The Department of Energy does not believe in American energy. In addition to the reporting I did on the corruption there, you know, there's that famous clip of Granholm being asked, what is the Jennifer Granholm plan to reduce energy costs? And she just laughs at the interviewer. So this is an administration that by design is trying to punish American oil and gas producers. They've shut off drilling leases in and around Maryland's 6th Congressional District in Pennsylvania as well. So they've made it clear that these are not people and industries that they want to support if they're in America. 
if they're abroad, if they're coming from, from our enemies and adversaries, uh, then it's okay, right? It's, it's acceptable for Biden to say that Putin is a war criminal while buying Russian oil. And then after facing some criticism for that, he then shifts instead to buying Venezuelan yeah. oil. Which is, a narco, which is a narco terrorist state. Right. Why, why are we supporting Venezuela when we know we have the resources here in America? And that would be a great way to create and support jobs for our fellow Americans. So it's, it's very much a strategic decision by every Democratic administration to cripple this industry because it does not, it does not uh, align with their goals to drive us completely off oil at a time where we literally cannot afford to be doing that. You know, what do you think is driving the agenda? I mean, I see, you know, I see a lot of unity of purpose, whether you're looking at U.S. energy policy or it's uh, domestic uh, education policies with uh, very radical woke agendas in public schools and in universities or the rising levels of anti-Semitism in, in uh, progressive circles in the United States. I mean, it all just seems to be an incredibly anti-American agenda that everything that's happening is is trying to undermine American economy, American society. Um, where do you come on this issue? What, do you think it's stupidity? You think that it's uh, they're absolutely convinced, as AOC said, that the, the you know the world is going to disappear in what like twelve years? I guess we're down to ten. I mean, now. We're down to ten years now. We're down to ten. Yeah, so the countdown is on. I mean, how, do, do you think that this is virtue signaling? Do you think that this is anti-Americanism? Do you think that this is that they really are, they have become convinced that the world is going to be just a scorching mess in a decade and we're all going to be fried? Um, well, I think it's all, it's all of them. And looking specifically from a foreign policy lens, this is the way I, I sort of formulated this theory, and I'm sure that you and your listeners find it probably correct, which is that the only thing that unites the Democratic Party on foreign policy is po post 2015 is the Iran deal and the party's unwillingness to admit that it made a mistake. And in fact, now we see a doubling down on this mistake. So that's exactly why, as we think, how is it possible for Biden to say that Putin is a war criminal yet fund the Russian war machine? Well, I mean, as you and your listeners know, Putin was negotiating on behalf of the United States, the Iran deal in Vienna, and were it not for the substantial blowback of funding Putin, we would probably still be buying Russian oil instead of buying American oil. So you see that, that to me- No, is, instead of buying you know, Venezuelan oil, instead of- buying Well, instead of buying Venezuelan <laughs> Right, exactly. So that to me, I think explains the, um, the foreign policy thing. And I think part of that is a deep hatred of Israel and a desire to punish Israel uh, and, and try and reorient the Middle East towards Iran and away from our traditional allies in the region. And then on a domestic policy level, the, the rationale for these is it's a deep anti-Americanism, which you see in the uh, uh, curriculum that are being put forward across the country, which one of the first stories I covered as a reporter was one of the draft curricula in California for the state's ethnic studies curriculum, which will be uh, taught and by law is now required to be taught across the state. And in, Maryland? Uh, in California. Oh, in Carolina. And yeah. so um, one, of the, one of the criticisms of it was it described Jews as a category as privileged and uh, it ignored any instances of anti-Semitism in history. Um, I believe it omitted the Holocaust, if I recall correctly and um, or at least heavily downplayed the Holocaust. So this is what um, you know we see being taught in schools. My reporting also was, I was the first reporter to confirm the obvious, which is that critical race theory is embedded in Maryland public school curricula because I received the, uh, an email from one of the Board of Education members confirming that fact. So this is a very ideological uh, war on America, American exceptionalism and uh, excellence. You know, we just saw in Oregon, for example, the state's Department of Health uh, sent out an email saying that punctuality is a feature of white supremacy. I mean, this is, wokeness is in far more institutions 
in American life than we realize. And it's something that even when we don't have the White House, we need to be forthrightly spotlighting, combating, and defeating. And there's a lot of work that we can do simply by being in the congressional majority. Because one thing that I realized as a reporter was, look, even if Republicans are in the minority, if a, if a single Republican member of Congress, or you know, sometimes more, uh, writes letters about issues, that's an immediate way of, if nothing else, elevating it to a level where it wasn't before. And so having a member of Congress like me, who has been on the front lines of the battles that you're talking about is going to be incredibly helpful and consequential towards spotlighting the creeping wokeness that's taking over K through 12, higher ed, um, sports, the government and beyond. You know, it's interesting because, you know, AOC, who's also very young, and she I think she was first elected. If, if you're elected, you'll be you'll be inaugurated into office when you're 26. And I think she was 28 when she was uh, inaugurated. Um, and um, she's had an electrifying effect on on younger people in the United States that she's sort of seen as their I mean, she, uh, she has become such an important person in American politics because she has managed to convince people that she speaks for her for your generation. And um, you, on the other hand, I, I, I mean, how do you see it? Do you see that the, the polls show that really the very large, that a significant majority of people who are under 30 uh, are very far to the left in the United States today? Where, where do you assess uh, the situation in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, what are you guys generation X or Z or Q, or <laughs> I don't know, whatever, whatever generation you are, who's, uh, uh, who was born in the 19, late 1980s, 1990s. How do you see the breakdown? Um, and what do you think would happen if you, if you, if you're elected to Congress, will you become a lightning rod for hatred by the AOC people? I mean, how do you see the, the dynamic playing out? I mean, look, this has always been the case, right? Throughout history is young people are liberal and old people are conservative because they are wiser and have paid decades more in taxes. So I don't, I don't think- <laughs> Well, they say that a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged by reality or- or liberal, so this is the problem, right? or liberal with experience or something like that. I don't know. People are getting bugged all over the place in America now. And that's a direct consequence of the Democratic Party's defunding the police, um, the, lack of securing our border. So it's not, you know, what, when you're walking around, you know, someone who is a criminal is not asking if you're a Republican or a Democrat as they are mugging you, stealing your wallet knowing that the police are not able to prioritize that crime because they're dealing with the surge in violent crime in the country that we haven't seen in my lifetime. So the way I think about this- In anybody's this is, lifetime, this is unprecedented. I mean, well, this is the thing, is the problems that we're facing now are not unique to any part of the country. They're not unique to the coast. They're not unique to the Midwest, to the South. Everyone is paying more at the pump. There's no, when you go to the gas, there's no Democratic pump, Republican pump, independent pump. Every Everyone is hurting in the country right now across generations. And whether you're young, like you and me, whether you're old, you know, you are you are feeling the uncertainty. We're we're careening into a recession right now, which I think will be officially declared later this month. And um, you know, inflation is the highest it's been in living memory. And everyone sees it when they go to the grocery store. So I think what we're seeing are policy results of unified Democratic Party rule, right? Declaring war on American energy, declaring war on law enforcement, spending trillions of dollars and thinking that there's no inflationary uh, reaction to that sort of thing. So I think that the, the dire straits that we're in hopefully are an opportunity for us to speed up the conversion process of young people as they realize that unified Democratic Party rule makes them less safe, makes their paycheck worth less, makes their job harder to maintain. So, but I, I think that's sort of the, the reality right now is we're facing problems that affect you, whether you're born today or, you know, 90 plus. Well, if you're it, born today, then you're going to be hungry because there's no baby formula, right? Well, yeah, exactly. And that's because the Biden admins FDA shut down the plant, right? And now we're importing, we're, we're begging other countries to feed our children. And, you know, these are, 
every problem that we're facing happened for a reason. And basically every problem that I can think of that people actually care about, inflation, the economy, jobs, energy prices, supply chains, are a direct cause of this administration. And the fact that the JV team is the ones running the country, right? I mean, we have, we've already talked at length about our corrupt energy secretary, but remember that our transportation secretary left the job for six weeks and no one even noticed because Pete Buttigieg is such a non-entity in, in this government. He left for paternity leave and no one even noticed he was gone. I mean, he's, as we were, as we were facing that shipping log jam on the West Coast, Right. He was completely MIA and no one even thought, to, you know, that he could be part of the solution because the Biden administration is part of the problem here. And mm -hmm. that's why, look, I, I mean, we're stuck with these people until 2024. But what we can do is at least shine spotlights on the problems posed by the Biden administration with actual congressional oversight um, in a way that shows the American people, whether they're my generation or an older generation, we cannot put these people back in charge. You know, they have failed us every step of the way. They've made the world a more dangerous place. They've made America a more unaffordable place. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's important for me to be in Congress as opposed to working as a reporter. I've, a, a weird question I've, I've gotten asked a non-zero amount of times is, um, you know, we need you in journalism. Why are you leaving journalism? It's, it's almost a shame that you're leaving to go be in Congress. And I said, look, what, what people don't understand, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on this too, having run for office yourself, is this is this sort of exemplifies it to me. I went to an event uh, in Montgomery County where Jennifer Granholm was promoting solar energy at a house, and I was working as a reporter for this. And this was after I had been covering her corruption. And I show up there, I listen to the whole event. Everyone is, of course, clapping like seals. I walk up to her at the end and I say, Secretary Granholm, uh, I'm a reporter. And she sees that I'm young. She hears that I'm a reporter. So she assumes that I'm far left. And uh, I said, look, you know, this was green energy events. I just wanted to know on the subject of green energy, I've been trying to contact your office to find out who the mystery buyer of hundreds of thousands of shares of your non-public stock in this company that you were overseeing is, you know, could you please tell me? By the time I finished my sentence, she was gone. She was in the car her staff was around me. They said, have you reached out to us? I said, yes, about a dozen times. So I came in person to, to ask in person. And they said, we'll get back to you. That was last summer. Last summer. We still don't know who's financially influencing our energy secretary. For all we know, Hunter Biden bought her stock. And, uh, or the Communist Party of China. You never know. And literally anyone could have been financially influencing our energy secretary. And it's a problem that we don't know that. And I don't need to tell you that if this were a Republican energy secretary and the tables were reversed, this would be a national scandal. But the media is hell-bent on protecting both Joe Biden and the entire well, Biden. What can you do about that in Congress? What, what can you do from Congress about that? How can you get answers? Well, I've already, during the course of the campaign, worked very closely with my friends in conservative media, who are the only people who have any interest in the media sphere, obviously, of holding Democrats accountable. So what I think we can do is have the so sorts of hearings like what Daryl Issa did back in the Obama administration right. and circumvent the media that will literally never do their jobs. Like, think about this. When I was doing my reporting on how Congress has been closed to the American public for two and a half years, unless you lived in D.C., you didn't realize this. You didn't realize that the government we pay for is literally not accessible to you. And remember, we have a Capitol Hill press corps. Their job is to inform the American people of what's happening in our government. At least that's what I thought. And uh, so I did their job for them. I walked around, took photos and videos of how Democrats are literally not working. One of my favorite examples is the Senate Democrats Policy Committee is, uh, they have windows so you can see in their office. It had newspapers piled to the ceiling because no one has been there for two and a half years and they've been using it as a storage closet. After I reported this, what was their solution? The Senate Democrats Policy Committee? They took their name off the door. <laughs> and then the week after, they threw out all the newspapers, and now the room is empty. The Democrats' policy committee is literally an empty room that no one works in. And we have a Capitol Hill press corps that theoretically should be interested in these things, but they're not. So once I'm in Congress, I'll be able to actually work with people in the media who have any interest in truth, like yourself, your colleagues, and conservative reporters, in showing the American people, look, this is what's actually happening 
and our government. And you guys need to be made aware of this by us because the mainstream media will literally never do this. You know, um, just to switch for a second to, you know, things that that my my uh, readers read about for me, which is anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, yeah. I'm just looking here, you know, at uh, the levels of hatred, the levels of discrimination that Americans, American Jewish students are facing on campuses. And they're just, this is the World Jewish Congress, and they're just giving some what they call the low light. So at University of Vermont, student organization told, um, told, um, what's it called? Uh, sorry, uh, a University of Vermont student organization told Jewish sexual assault survivors they weren't welcome. Students at Michigan State and, and York were met with anti-Semitic graffiti immediately upon returning to campuses. Mezuzot were ripped off the doors at Tufts and Northeastern. Uh, University of Toronto Student Union proposed banning kosher food sourced from companies that support Israel and so on and so forth. So one of the most significant things that uh, President Trump did during his uh, during his term in office was that he extended Title IX uh, Civil Rights Act uh, protection to Jewish students on campuses. And, um, you know, it appears uh, that uh, the Biden administration's education department is not enforcing uh, the executive order, at least not in any significant way. Um, what do you make of the situation, and what what would what would a, what would Congress be able to do to protect uh, the Jewish students who are facing rampant uh, discriminatory uh, treatment on on college campuses to the point where many of them describe, including in Harvard uh, most recently, uh, that they're in a hostile environment. Well, look, I know this myself as a former college activist who was. Anti, like an anti-BDS activist, uh, you know, I had to leave my dorm my first year because of the death threats that I was getting. So I know exactly- What were they about? Tell me, I, I don't remember that I was told this story. What, what happened? Yeah, so this is uh, in my first year um, when uh, our student government was proposing BDS or it was just a standard, you know, uptick in anti-Semitism at a college campus, I don't remember. But um, I was, you know, pushing back on this very vocally in person and at events and things like that. And um, there was a now non-existent. That's my uh, boy. That's my boy, right? You see that? Well, look, I mean, <laughs> you know, this is this obviously runs in the family. And so I was pushing back on this. And there's an app that no longer exists called Yik Yak, where people can post anonymously that's geolocated. You can't if you're posting and I'm reading it at the University of Chicago, you're you're there. And uh, so, you know, I would get it was standard vitriol. Of course, you know, we're all used to that. But then it would be very specific dates. You know, this would be my last day. And uh, I printed out dozens of pages of these, took them to the police, and they said, look, this app strongly protects user privacy. You'll never know who was saying that this is your last day on earth. And uh, so I previously I had my I had an open door policy. Anyone could always just come into my dorm room at any hour of the day, chat about whatever's on their mind. I locked my door, moved out for I think a week. Uh, until the Fuhrer subsided. Uh, so and what was the Fuhrer that over that you were you were openly speaking out against the BDS uh, resolution that they were trying to pass to the student government? Or I can't remember if it was about BDS specifically or if it was just, you know, there was some flare up in Israel and uh, the anti-Israel activists were, you know, in their usual foaming at the mouth outrage. But it's a huge problem. And this is this story for me is is emblematic of any pro-Israel student and you know this would even happen with pro-Israel activists who are on the left at U Chicago with me and around the country is if you are Jewish if you are pro-Israel you can never you can never truly find a home in the intersectional uh, oppression Olympics and at some point these people will see the light and realize that the left has no place for them so huge problem and uh, nothing happened with the people who were threatening my life nothing happens to the people who threaten the lives of anti-bds activists around the country pro-israel activists around the country philo-semitic activists around the country so first understanding this is a huge problem i think there is a disconnect between older republicans and how bad things are in both colleges and increasingly in k-12 through schools around the country because look it's hard to fathom that you can be an American student, have your life threatened, and have nothing happen to you. But that is have no have nobody protect you. And that that is what you that's what you sign up for when you say I oppose BDS. And it has a chilling effect, obviously, that keeps people 
you know, who otherwise are normal and sane, which is about 80% of students don't care about this or oppose this. But then you have this radical fringe egged on by SJP and their insane intersectional alliance. So what now going forward to what can be done, when I was working as a reporter um, at the Washington Free Weekend, I'm just pulling up some of the stories that I covered about BDS and anti-Semitic activism on campus. And this was uh, last May when Hamas was, you know, in, in its usual time to fire thousands of rockets to indiscriminately murder Jews, Muslims, and Christians in Israel. I see this here, and from one of the stories I wrote, the University of Michigan student government condemned the school for its complicity in Israel's violence. Well, and and Rutgers, right? They apologized for for saying that anti-Semitism was wrong because it wasn't including the, the Palestinian students as well. The examples of this are so many, it's literally impossible to keep them all together. And so what we need to do is um, also the... So first, we need to understand and recognize this is not a problem that's going away unless we fight this. And to your point on the Department of Education simply not protecting Jewish students, remember that the Department of Education, my colleagues were the one who showed that it's colluding with the National School Board Association to label parents concerned about these types of issues domestic terrorists. Right. So that was what we on the outside were able to do simply as conservative reporters was have 26 states leave the National School Board Association because of this. So what you can do having an ally in Congress forcing this issue even more with the power of the congressional majority, I don't know exactly where that leads, but I think that you know having people spotlight this as an important, as a critically important issue for the safety and security of our fellow Americans is, is, is super, important because we see that the Biden administration unfortunately has no interest in actually doing this, which is a problem that makes students less safe. It makes them a lot less safe. It makes Jews less safe. I mean, when you're talking yep. about what happened last May, you know, you had Jews who were being bullied and attacked and assaulted. And in Boston, a rabbi was stabbed, yep. you know, against the backdrop of uh, of the Hamas uh, missile attacks on Israel that, that month in Israel. And, and also with the pogroms that Arab Israeli suits, uh, citizens were carrying out against their Jewish neighbors in places like Jaffa and Lod and Akko and other, country, and other cities. So, you know, I think I think one of the things that really has to happen is in, in Israel, it's very clear that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are exactly the same thing because yeah. that's just how it, it, first of all, it manifests itself most strongly in that way here, but it also manifests itself most strongly in that way in the United States and in France and in Canada and 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 in Britain and throughout the world. So it's really, uh, and, and this also goes to something that you worked on when you were in high, in college, which was the uh, free speech movement, because one of the things that the you know, you talked about free speech for, for conservatives, and I want to get into that because it's really important. But I also want to talk about the defense that they're using for, they're using free speech rights as the justification for harassing Jewish students uh, on college campuses. How do you, first, can you first talk about what you did on free speech on campuses and then talk, like, how do you square that when they're pre presenting harassment of Jewish students as a form of free speech? So the final point I'll say on, on the previous question for right now is this is manifesting itself in uh, policy and appointments in the Biden administration at the highest level. So some of the appointees- You mean the support, the support for anti-Semitism? Support for anti-Semitism, right. support for BDS. And this is someone who your listeners are familiar with, Dilawar Syed, who is one of the senior administration officials at the Small Business Administration, which is in charge of, you know, helping support small businesses, many of which are owned by Jews or people who support Israel. Uh, Dilawar Sayed is a veteran BDS activist. And, uh, you know, we have someone who's on record supporting boycotting the Jewish state now in charge of helping support small businesses. It's not just him. There's another person I covered called Anton Hajar, who was put, uh, who was basically stealthily confirmed over the summer who is, uh, he's a senior administration official now at the Postal Services Board of Governors. So we see real consequences in terms of both uh, personnel and policy. When You Democrat have Mahir Bittar, who is, the, who is the director of intelligence at the National yeah. Security 
Council, who was a BDS activist at Georgetown. So, I mean, you have you have that too. You know, you've got all kinds of Rima Dodin, who praised uh, uh, suicide bombers, who's the liaison for the White House to Congress. You know, you have and and so and the and, so and the White House spokeswoman, what's her name? The new one. Uh, she she also uh, has a record of supporting uh, BDS and of calling for for Democratic uh, presidential candidates to boycott APAC. So, and I think so. To your point, we're seeing this, of course in foreign policy positions, but we're also seeing this now- In domestic policy. Even, even on a level where we didn't see this during the Obama administration because the Democratic Party has gone even farther to the left in just the past 10 years. So you're right, we see it obviously with Batar on a foreign policy level, that, that's almost to be expected. But then when you see BDS activists in places in, on a domestic policy side where they can boycott Jewish businesses in America, that's even more concerning, you know, the, so we're, we're seeing the expansion of BDS, both in the Democratic Party and in the Biden administration. So it's important, even though on the House side, they don't have any role in voting on most nominees, right? All of these are going to be Senate confirmed people for the most part. We can still do a lot of work on that level. So another person who I had written about and were it not for my reporting, I don't think anyone even would have heard of this person uh, in this context. But Corey Hinderstein is someone who the Biden administration nominated, who claimed that Iran is not pursuing nuclear weapons. Well, this is the official position of the Biden administration, right? So that's true. But this person, Corey Hinderstein, was his nominee to counter nuclear weapons proliferation. So you know, I mean, it's it's a joke, right? I mean, this, this is what we see from the administration. So even though I won't be in a position to be voting against these people, because that's not the role of the House of Representatives, what I can do is elevate it even in an even more uh, profound way of, you know, this is a serious problem that the Biden administration's pick to counter nuclear weapons proliferation is living in this fantasy world where Iran is not actively pursuing these every day. It goes sort of to the disinformation board, which was being run by one of the most prominent uh, promulgators of disinformation. Of disinformation. Yeah. And so everything is upside down when you look at the Biden administration. The Department of Energy does not believe in energy. The Department of Education is the Department of Indoctrination. The person who's in charge of nuclear weapons, non-proliferation, thinks that Iran is not sprinting towards nuclear weapons every single day, even as the Biden administration makes it their official policy that they want Iran to be a nuclear armed country. So that's sort of to put a bow on that. And then where were we going? What was your next We question? were going to the free speech issue and the oh, defense of, uh, of anti, anti-Jewish anti uh, harassment as a free speech issue on the one hand, and on the other hand, the constraints on speech through speech codes and other things that are that are imposed on uh, non-woke students at, at college campuses. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, something I've been doing for a very, very, very long time. And a lot of the most prominent education and free speech activists in Maryland have endorsed my campaign because they realize that, you know, we need someone who, again, has gone through these themselves to really understand the gravity of the problem. So, uh, you know, I am a staunch believer in the First Amendment and think that free speech is one of the most important rights that we have as Americans and we see across the world. If you don't have that First Amendment, you, you have no freedom. And even Western countries were curtailing free speech, free association, and, uh, and continue to do that. So we're lucky to live in America, but this is a right that is not recognized increasingly by a lot on the left who equate speech with violence, which it's not. I'm someone who has been on uh, the receiving end of a lot of speech that does not make me feel good, but it's very clear that there's a line at which point um, speech can become violence when they're saying that we're going to murder you. That is no longer protected speech. But we live in a country where there are very clear guidelines towards what is protected speech, but we're seeing those guidelines being eroded by both K through 12 and colleges. So when I was at the University of Chicago, which is one of the few schools in the world which actually protects free speech for everyone, which is how it should be done. Uh, I worked very closely with the school to host a free speech, a national free speech conference with students from around the country there to uh, kickstart this organization that I started to have other schools adopt the University of Chicago's free speech policies, which are incredibly non-controversial. It just basically says that free speech is good. And we as the school are not going to be the arbiters 
of what is and is not allowable speech. Outside of academia, that's an incredibly non-controversial position. Inside, well, although academia, it's becoming increasingly controversial in a lot of U.S. <laughs> corporations, you know that's that's true, you know, and we do see this creeping wokeness taking over corporations as well. We'll talk about that, but um, you know, so that and then after I did this conference, the Speaker of the House of the Wisconsin Legislature reached out to me and said, "Hey, you know, we're trying to push for a free speech bill in Wisconsin, and we can't find any students here who are willing to talk about this publicly. Would you be willing to come and testify?" So. I drove over uh, to Wisconsin, testified that the First Amendment is a good thing, and it protects students of all political beliefs. And every single Democrat in that committee voted against the bill to protect students' free speech rights. So um, I'm also on the board of this awesome organization called Speech First, which sues colleges and universities that implement these insane bias response teams, these insane speech codes, that are almost always weaponized against conservatives. But here's the thing, even if they were being weaponized against liberals, that's still unconstitutional, that's still illegal. The schools should still be punished. It just so happens that in practice, they're, they're always used uh, to, to punish and chill conservative speech. Um, so this is, I mean, this is a huge problem. How, how can we have a functional democracy when we don't have the ability to speak what's on our minds. And so again, when you when you look at the the position of the Congress and what what and the powers of the Congress, I mean, one of the things that were uh, raised, particularly after uh, Trump uh, Trump uh, um, published his executive order uh, protecting Jewish students on campuses, um, was that you can look at funding, federal funding of universities, federal yeah. funding of K through twelve, uh, as a means to. Uh, end a lot of this harassment of conservatives, harassment of uh, non woke students, and of course harassment of Jewish students. Is that something that you know you think is can be done if if Republicans win the majority in the House, and or do you need the the White House to do it? I mean, how how can that? What can be done to to punish these institutions? I mean, we're definitely at a point where these these schools need to be taught that there are consequences and looking at the wokeness aspect uh, more broadly than just when it comes to anti Semitism. Um, earlier or late last year and then early this year, a professor at the University of Memphis reached out to me He said, hey, is it a story that my school is bribing professors to incorporate our schools social justice principles in our curriculum. And I said, that's insane. I've never heard of this. Where, where do you teach? He said, I teach at the University of Memphis. And I said, this is a state school in a red state. What is going on here? How, how is this possible? And um, so I first wrote the story, University of Memphis offers to bribe professors to go woke. And um, basically what the, pro what the program was, was you get half of the payment up front and then half of the payment at the end of the uh, course being completed. And this professor said to me, look, I'm an econ professor. There is no social justice in econ. Why is this school trying to make me change my curriculum to include things that I can't? And so after I exposed that the program existed, I reached out to the Tennessee governor's office and said, what is going on here? This is a red state public school. How are these bribes to professors even being allowed. They said, you know, we're going to look into this. So the next week, the program was canceled. But had I not covered this, this program would still be going on. This program would be in effect right now. So what I think my role can be is a couple of things here. One is exposing these problems that exist. And there, we, we do have, these, these things are so insane that we don't need the White House to cancel some of these things, especially on a state level. But unfortunately, my point is I shouldn't have been the one to first expose what's happening at the University of Memphis in Tennessee, but for whatever reason I was. So I wanna make sure that I'm being able to give voice to people here in Maryland who've been ignored by Democrats for 10 years, and especially by my opponent who literally is unreachable to, to my future constituents and uh, shine a spotlight on these things, hopefully to the point where we can get these programs canceled. And sure, that's just one victory. But again, that was what I was able to accomplish as a reporter is cancel bribes 
for social justice. It's not often and, that that a that a that a journalist can actually get instant results. So that 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 is, I mean, you you had a very short and extremely uh, consequential uh, uh, journalism career. So. Um, I, I, I'm always stunned by the kind of results that you were able to get and just imagine what you'd be able to do if, if you're in the Congress, um, if you can do this as a, as a reporter at a, at a, at a, at a, at a conservative uh, news website. Um, I, I agree. And, and, and let's just bring it for, for a while to, to Maryland itself. Um, you, know, you were on a podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't remember what it was called. You can Tim, remind Timcast. me. What's it called? Tim Cast. Tim Cast's uh, 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 podcast. And he was talking about the fact that uh, the regulatory situation uh, in Maryland is, is so bad that he's moving his company to West Virginia. And obviously, a lot of this are, these are state issues with the state government. But you know, the regulatory situation in the United States for, for small businesses, it was one of the things that the Trump administration was trying to scale back all of Cass Sunstein's regulations that were making it difficult, if not impossible, to do business in the United States, to operate small businesses in the United States. What sort of things uh, do you think can be done in Congress to try to make life easier for people in Maryland and really for, for the rest of the country who want to own and operate small businesses, um, what can be done? What, what has to be done? I mean, this is, this is really one of the most important issues facing our country right now is how do we continue emerging from coronavirus after, during which a lot of these small businesses were told that they are non-essential, were told that they cannot operate. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. One is the benefit of us taking over Congress is there's 0% chance of the Democrats planned $5 trillion of further spending happening, right? The build five back- trillion, Five trillion, five trillion. Five trillion, yeah. Five, I mean, it's, it's literally- in All borrowed from China, right? Exactly, and we can't pay for any of this. And we'll be told that, that those added trillions of dollars won't further destroy our economy, economy, won't further devalue our currency, won't further drive us off a fiscal cliff, right? So that's all dead on arrival, and uh, which is a huge relief to whether you're a small business owner or consumer and customer, um, that's going to be critical. Um, then what we also need to do, though, is, again, I mean, we'll see how much we can do with a Democrat in the White House, but try and repeal as many of the regulations that are crippling every small business in America. You know, you can't go to a single small business in Maryland and anywhere in the country that feels like it's being supported by the government right now. And in the case in my district where we have a, the most absentee member of Congress in the country, these businesses need a partner who will actually show up, who will actually work with them to address the concerns that they have, whether those concerns are supply chain related, whether those concerns are job hiring and retention related right now. Because remember that in America, we're paying people to not work. So in a lot of cases, you actually make more money with these uh, welfare checks than you would if you were working at a small business. So we need to make it so that the small businesses can hire customers. We need to make it so that the supply chain is not reliant solely on China, like it's been for far too long, that we're actually creating things in America. So that way we're not reliant on our adversaries for basic, you know, PPE and things like that. So we need it to be possible. Antibiotics, for, right? I mean, you don't make antibiotics in the United States. And I'll say one thing on that in a second, but we need it to be a business climate so that these small businesses can hire talent and retain talent and then remain open, right? Every business in America is essential. And the fact that we were, the government was saying what businesses are and are not allowed to be open is one of the most perverse uh, side aspects of the coronavirus. Every business and every business owner is essential and needs to be treated and recognized as such because those are the backbones of our country. And uh, to your point on pharmaceuticals, remember we, when the Biden administration attempted to roll out the free COVID test kits in America, which was a complete joke. It made the Obamacare rollout look like, you know, the launch of the new iPhone. Um, <laughs> you couldn't get COVID test kits for weeks on end. One of the three companies that was sending COVID, that the government sent COVID test kits to was a Chinese company. And uh, so I worked closely with Congress from the reporter side on this. I said, look, 
you know, I, I obtained the contract from the military that's giving $1.6 billion to a Chinese company for COVID test kits. And I worked in this case with uh, Congressman Mike Waltz from Florida, American hero, Navy SEAL, uh, also one of the members of Congress who's endorsed me. And he, he described this perfectly. He said, paying China for COVID test kits is like paying the arsonist who started the fire. And, and that's the priority of the Biden administration. And I, I don't understand that, but it's a no brainer that we need to be making, whether it's COVID test kits, PPE, or just general medicine here in America, how, how on earth can we be reliant on China for things like Tylenol? You know, that it, it, it is a national security threat that we could ever be reliant on them for anything mission critical, again, after we've seen what they've done to the entire world for two and a half years. You know, it, it, one of the things that people have been bemoaning for a long time is the absence or the loss of bipartisanship in the United States. I mean, you saw over the past decade that uh, through gerrymandering um, and primarying uh, in de Democrat districts, um, you have fewer and fewer what used to be called blue dog Democrats, moderate Democrats. I think the last Democrat, uh, Lempinski from suburban Chicago, who was pro life was and also pro-Israel was primaried out of office, I think in the last election cycle by a pro-Palestinian uh, uh, activist. And there are no more pro-life Democrats in the in the Congress. Um, and one of the one of the really interesting uh, things that have happened as a result of, of the failure of the Democrat gerrymandering in places like Maryland in your district and, and in New York and, and I think in other states as well, is that for the first time in a lot of these places, you're seeing mixed districts so that your district moved from something like, what was it, plus 10 Democrat yeah. to, pl to plus one Republican. And, and, and that, you know, uh, I was talking to a colleague about it last week and, and uh, both sort of thought that that may be the end or maybe the beginning of the end of, of the woke domination of the Democrat party, because if you have more districts where you actually have to convince people from across the aisle to vote for you in order to win office, then you're, the, the ability of, uh, of, of woke radicals to be elected will be diminished. Um, when you look at your district, which right now is plus one Republican, I mean, you're, it's not like every Republican is going to come out and, and vote on, on election day. So how do you think as a 25 year old uh, with very clear ideas about the way that the government should work, where do you see yourself standing in terms of the uh, bipartisan uh, um, bipartisanship? This district is actually one of the best in the country to test that theory in because what I say to anyone, because you know, there and there are a reflection of this is there are a lot of houses where I'm knocking on doors where half are Republicans and half are Democrats. No, that's really. as it should be. You know, that, that should, you know, that's that's a sign of a healthy democracy that you can have, you know, split households and it's no problem. They don't even think twice about it. But so when I'm knocking on the door and the Democrat answers. And I say, look, you know, you can't vote for me in the Republican primary. You can vote for me on November 8th in the general election. And um, this is my promise to anyone in this district, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, independent, communist, anarchist, libertarian, Green Party, uh, you'll actually have a full time representative here, which we have not had. And whether you are far right or far left and you write to David Trone, the alleged congressman of this district, he's an equal opportunity ignorer. You know, that mailbox that's overflowing in Hagerstown, they don't sift out the mail to see who's a supporter and who's not a supporter. They don't care about anyone. So this is a great chance to remove one of literally the most out of touch and lazy members of Congress and replace him with someone who, whether I agree or disagree with the constituents, they'll at least have someone whose offices are open during business hours. You know, that's, that's the bare minimum we can expect from our government. And we've been denied that for over half of my opponent's time in Congress, his offices have been closed and locked to the people who are paying for him to work there. So that I think gives me a great opportunity to be hearing from people who agree with me, disagree with me. And as a Republican Jew, I've been in and around communities where I'm an ideological minority most of my life. And I think that the opportunity for conservatives in, in the the situation you're describing is tremendous because every conservative in the country and in the sixth district of Maryland hears 
every liberal viewpoint on everything. It's, we, we can't escape it. Every liberal in America has a much harder time even hearing the conservative viewpoint on anything. So we can go credibly to any person in this country and understand ideologically where they're coming from on issues where they agree with us or disagree with us and either try and ideally win them over. You know, it's great to have more Republicans or at least get to a point where, you know, we understand and respect the other person's opinion. Because the way I view this is, you know, at the end of the day, America should not be divided between Republicans and Democrats, because right now, in this moment in history, it is all of us need to be united against the Chinese Communist Party, because they also are indiscriminate haters of Americans, regardless of our partisanship. They are trying to dominate the world. And right now, the Biden administration is incredibly weak and allowing them to do so. But, you know, we need to make sure that at the end of the day, we're keeping our eye on the prize and not letting, you know, not dropping the ball and allowing you know, China to take over the world. You know, it's not just the the Chinese Com Communist Party um, that that's a problem. I mean, I, I just uh, while I was just looking, you know, I, your mom and I grew up in Chicago and you went to school there and I'm just looking at the crime data, you know, so in July to date, uh, there's this great website called, you know, Hey Jackass, and it's since so July to date, uh, shot and killed in Chicago, 10, shot and wounded, 40, total shot, 10, summer of joy from May 27th to June 6th, shot and killed, 87, shot and wounded, 385, total shot, 472, year to date, 2022, shot and killed, 307, shot and wounded, 1,331. I mean, I think you know, the, the point that I'm getting driving at here is, I mean, the situation on the ground in the United States is becoming so problematic. It's becoming so dangerous in the cities of this country, of, of, of the United States. And we're, we're going into J July 4th. I'm talking to you on July 3rd. And people are afraid to go out and have barbecues. And last year in Chicago on July 4th, a bunch of kids were killed with drive-by shootings when they were on their porches having barbecued with their family. And it's happening in Baltimore. It's happening in cities and in rural areas all over the United States. So I think that you know, a lot of people are looking at these elections as, as a way to turn back the clock and to, and to restore safety to the streets. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, maybe Democrats in the Maryland 6th District will feel the same way. Do you have crime problems there as well? What is it, was it like there? Yes. I mean, there, there are, you know, classic areas of this district where violent crime had not been an issue until recently. And uh, in Montgomery County specifically, the cost of living is so high that a lot of Montgomery County police officers actually don't even live in the community that they're there to protect because it costs too much to live here and they're not paid enough so when i was uh, at a fourth of july thing yesterday talking with this cop in brunswick in frederick county he's moving to florida you know we're, we're shedding the people who are supposed to be protecting us here in maryland and around the country and it's a huge problem so one of the things that i tell voters is look i mean we need to be defending the police we cannot be defunding them we need to be defending the people at the border who are supposed to be protecting America from Chinese made fentanyl pouring across the border from most wanted terrorists pouring across the border. Yet the Biden administration is focused on persecuting these people, right? I mean, remember that there was a viral hoax that uh, the border patrol were whipping right. illegal immigrants while well, they were doing no from such Haiti. thing. Was, right. You know, the, the investigation of these uh, border patrol agents took months and, uh, you know, sapped morale. So we need to be defending these people. We need to be defending law enforcement. And you know, one of the stories I would write every quarter at the Free Beacon was I would go through the campaign finance reports of Democrats who want to defund the police. Go figure, all of these people pay for private security who, guess what, were former police, law enforcement, military. So you know, these people who want to make us less safe are doing so from their, um, you know, their gated mansions. And the American people should be afforded the same type of law enforcement protection that Democrats who want to defund the police get. So everyone, I mean, crime relates to everyone, you know, and, and Democrats are, and another story, obviously I would cover a lot was all of these Soros backed district attorneys across the country who don't prosecute crime. And uh, the way that the manifest, what this manifests as I think was best described by Tom Cotton, who said that, uh, you know, when you have a Soros DA, uh, criminals have 
two advocates. They have their criminal defense attorney and they have the district attorney right. who's supposed to be prosecuting them. And I look at San Francisco uh, recalling their communist district attorney. San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, right? I mean, this is the commie central of America. And yet crime is affecting all of them. It's affecting small businesses, right? They would stay, they, they stopped prosecuting theft of under $500. So $900, retail- 900, 900. Oh, 900. dollars So all of the retailers just said, look, we're closing. We're, we're moving out of here. And, uh, you know, this is not sustainable for our country. So if these people are able to realize, wow, there are huge consequences to our virtue signaling votes, we need to get these people the hell out of office. You know, there's hope for, I mean, the Democrats here are much saner in this district. Right. Well, listen, um, you know, I, I think we've talked a lot about a lot of things. And one of the unifying theories of uh, democratic malfeasance and misgovernance is really that across the board, everywhere you look on, on just, you know, on rents, uh, home ownership down, rents skyrocketing, uh, 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 marriage rates down, uh, um, childbirth down, everything's down. And then except for inflation, which is skyrocketed. And, you know, and, and you look at, you look at the numbers, you look at the crime numbers, you look at everything. And I think that this is the prime time for Republicans to be able to take over Congress. I think it would be an incredible failure if they didn't, because I think, you know, Selena Zito wrote a piece in the Washington Examiner, the New York Post a couple of weeks ago from Pittsburgh. And, you're talking about people in urban slums who, you know, they're, they're, they don't get it, their basic services from the city. They're, they closed down. They wouldn't open up a city pool that served uh, people in the projects because uh, they couldn't guarantee their safety walking, you know, a, a couple of blocks from their apartment buildings to the city pool because to do so, you have to walk past an open market for drugs. And the city isn't doing anything about it. And her view was that you're going to see a lot of people who never thought of voting Republican voting Republican because they need somebody to save them. Um, and Matthew, you know, you, you in your short time on this earth so far, um, you've really been able to show a lot of results, which is why, you know, initially when 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 I'll just tell my viewers when my when my nephew was saying that he wanted to run for office. You know, initially, what can you do? Chronology speaks, right? So what are you talking about? You're 25. But on the other hand, you know, I think this may be the moment because we need people who are able to actually get things done. And we need people who understand how to get things done. And uh, so, you know, whether it's fighting anti-Semitism in the United States, fighting anti-Americanism in the United States, fighting anti humanism in the United States with the radical uh, sexualization of children um, and and anything else you want to look at. And obviously crime, it's inhumane. It's inhumane what they're doing to the cities of the country and also to rural areas that never had crime problems that are now stricken by violent crime. So, you know, um, what's your what's your parting words for uh, my viewers and listeners as we move forward uh, and, and and close down this very important family episode um, where where Aunt Carolyn is interviewing her nephew because it, and and I I think that all of my my nephews and nieces are are fantastic but I think that you should meet this one because uh, he's dedicating himself to public office and um, uh, and so what's your what's your parting uh, message to to the people watching us today? Well, the Glick clan, I mean, you know, people will be hearing from us for for generations to come. But I think that this year in yeah, particular, you know, I, I had no plan on doing this at all. I, I loved my job at the Free Beacon. I was doing incredibly consequential reporting, but I did feel like this is an opportunity we can't waste. We can't leave uh elections uncontested where republicans should be winning and that's what we were going to do if i didn't jump in this race which is why i did that and the way i think about 2022 both having been working with a lot of candidates as a reporter and now being one myself is this is the year of unconventional candidates people whose backgrounds don't necessarily lend themselves uh right off the bat to running for office but this is the year that we as normal people say enough is enough you know our country is going off a cliff i'm not going to be able to afford to live in america at the rate that we're going and this is an opportunity for us to step in and save the country and we need to stop trillions of dollars of spending that 
Democrats will pass if um, we don't win these elections. We need to stop the regulations that are coming from every single department in this administration that are crippling small businesses. And we need to actually look, I'm not an advocate for big government, but I am an advocate for the government doing the work that it's supposed to be doing, right? I mean, people in my district have had to cancel vacations because they can't reach David Trone to ask for passport help. I mean, this is, we're failing America on basic constituent services. And so for me as a reporter who was very results driven, I mean, my reporting has led to fairly substantial changes in policy and um, consequences for voters across this country. But I think it's not enough. I think there's a lot more we need to be doing. And when the government is failing people, when the government is failing to show up, when the government is shutting down businesses, uh, we need to say enough is enough. And that's why I said, look, we have the laziest member of Congress who can't be bothered to work, who doesn't show up, who doesn't open his offices. People in Maryland are suffering and he doesn't care because the economy is working out great for him because he's a multimillionaire who buys this seat. And we need someone who actually can relate and if nothing else, show up. You know, we were at a 4th of July thing last night. Even at the Democratic booth, David Trone didn't have anything. He didn't even send someone to put out literature. He cares that little about this job. And to me, as a good government-minded American, that's offensive. And uh, that's that's why I'm running. We need, we need someone who will show up, who will work, who will elevate the voices in the community that have been ignored for too long, and who will champion issues that actually matter, like saving our country, combating China, making it safe if you're a Jewish student to speak your mind on a college campus, um, work with our allies across the world to fight evil uh, and recognize that evil exists and combat it where it exists, uh, like most of the Middle East outside of Israel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, look, these are very low stakes, you know, <laughs> uh, it's just the future of the planet uh, in an actual way, not in a 10 years away from blowing up way that uh, we need to be focused on. And that's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm laser focused on that every day. As soon as we get off here, I'm gonna go door knock in Mount Airy again, where the mayor of Mount Airy is one of my local endorsements. And that's about uniting the country. Cause at the end of the day, look, in up until November 8th, it's Republican versus Democrat. But as far as I'm concerned, after that, it is America versus our adversaries. And we need to make that crystal clear. Well, I think that'd be great. You know, and on, on Thursday night, um, I finally saw what I'd been wanting to see for a long time, which is the new Top Gun movie, Maverick. Yeah. And um, and I loved it. Um, anybody who hasn't seen it yet, you should all watch it. But the thing that struck me so much were two things. One was I got out of that movie theater and I thought, America really needs this movie. It's a movie yeah. where Americans are the good guys and they're glad to be the good guys and they're not apologizing for anything and they're getting the bad guys and they're also the best, you know? And they, and they, and they encourage excellence. All of these things are the exact opposite of what you're getting out of Washington these right. days. And the other thing that, and so I came out just so happy and wistful because this is the America that we love. You know, and this is the America that is the last great hope of mankind, and we want it back. And and the other thing that I found extraordinary, which was we round out before we ended, is that it's one of the top grossing films, I think, of all time. Um, yeah, it opened in late April, and it's already grossed over a billion dollars um, and over $500 million in the United States uh, alone and, uh, and over a billion worldwide. And... Um, I think that there is a hunger also in the United States for the return, the restoration of sanity, the restoration of patriotism. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I say this as, as, uh, as an Israeli, uh, looking at the United States, you know, I feel like every week in this podcast, I'm talking about why Israel has to be careful of the United States because the United States is undermining Israel. And maybe people think that I don't like the United States. I love the United States. It's like the wordy L, you know, I love America, you know, it's, but America has to come back to itself. The world needs it yes. too. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of my nephew. I'm so proud of you, Matthew, that you're doing this, but I'm also very hopeful that this can work because um, it has to, because otherwise we're really, America is, is going down the wrong riverbed and, uh, and it's taken the rest of us uh, with it. And so I wish you all the luck in the world and God willing, you win your primary on July 19th. You've gotten a pass from going to your cousin's bar mitzvah because of this. So you better win or you'll be in big I trouble. Better. 
Yeah. yeah. I know. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll win. And when you do, we'll have you back on the uh, program again uh, before the general election. So, uh, so um, now all of you know uh, why I have a very special uh, nephew and Mike and Matthew Foldy and and other nephews as well. But they're not doing things that put them in in the headlines. So we'll. Well, well I just want to say, look, I have a very special aunt, and there's no one else on planet <laughs> Earth. I was, I would drop my career in America for and move to Israel with to uh, work to make a member of Knesset in 2019. Right, that's right. Matthew actually, first of all, you should know that Matthew may be 25, but he's been running campaigns since what you were in high school. Yeah. Isn't that right? You started, he, he, vo he volunteered as the campaign manager of a, of a congressional candidate when you were like 16, right? Yeah, well, and yeah. It didn't work out, but he got great, you, you got great experience. And then he came to Israel and, uh, and just, ran moved in and and ran our campaign while eating his really weird vegetarian food that we didn't quite know what to do about but okay everybody has their flaws he's a vegetarian but he's not anti-meat eaters i can tell right. you that. it's okay it's okay um so yes I, I think look i mean for two journalists talking and we buried the lead here that i moved to israel to help get you in office because this is about you kid it's not about oh. me so i'm trying to oh, be look, this a, is ultimately a professional about reporter <laughs> journalist and who happens to be your aunt but yes obviously so so matthew uh did in fact run my campaign and it was entirely uh it, it was a really professionally done campaign because he knows what he's doing as opposed to his aunt who lives in La La Land. Um, and it was definitely not his fault that we didn't get into Knesset. That was entirely Naftali Bennett's <laughs> fault. And I yell at you because I think I was the only one in the entire campaign who was actually campaigning thanks to Matthew, yes. Yeah. Well, you had the tenacity to do it. And uh, look, my, it's my personal hope that uh, Israelis have the opportunity to vote for you again at some point. I'm just right, well, 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 we'll see. Thank you very <laughs> much for that vote of confidence in your aunt, and I, and you get my full vote of confidence in you. So everybody, thanks again for tuning in and for watching, and uh, and and uh, obviously support for for Matthew Foldy would be uh, most welcome. So you can think about doing that at matthewfoldy.com while you also subscribe if you haven't yet to the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. And take care, all of you, and we will see you again next week. And I will not be interviewing another nephew next week, but- uh, but <laughs> Not but for a couple of weeks. Not for another couple of weeks, not until after the primaries. All right, so take care, Matthew. Awesome, thank you. Thank you.